today on the Rise of the Challenge podcast. My anxiety to where I gassed out, like I had a very good first round. Um, the, the second round was kind of, I, I still held on, but by the third round, I was done. Like I was just, my arms, like I couldn't even lift my arm, like up, much less block or, or throw anything. But that really taught me like, boxing's not about, it's not, a, it's not fighting. It's boxing, and that's a common thing that you know coaches will tell you. Is they'll say, "Don't, don't fight your opponent. You need to box your opponent. It's a craft. It's an art. It's more about managing yourself, your heart rate, your emotions, right, your anxiety, and it's about playing a game. It's an, it's like dancing. You know, you're trying to sort of tease him. You know, you're 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 you're, you're, you're trying to see what you're making him react to you, and then you hit it, right? It's not go it's not MMA, right? UFC. Welcome to the Rise of the Challenge podcast. Joined today, he's the CEO of Lumaflex and competitive athlete. It's John Graham. How are you doing today, John? Very good. Thank you so much for letting me be on the show. This is um it's always great to be given the opportunity to share, to have access to someone's audience. You've obviously built a lot of trust with your audience on your show and I'm getting access to them. So deep, uh, deep, sincere thanks for that. Um, because yeah, it's about getting the word out. It's about getting the word out about red light therapy and this natural non-invasive means of treatment and steering people away from drugs and pharmaceutical. We're so excited to have you on the show to talk about your rise to the challenge. What we'd like to do with all of our guests is go right to the beginning. Talk about where you're from and what you like doing growing up. Um, so uh, originally I'm Australian and growing up, I had, I was interested in, in sports and being competitive. Uh, that's why I like the name challenge, right? Rise to the challenge of your podcast. It was something I think from a very young age, I was very driven by challenge. Um, I wanted obviously to, w when you, when you approach a challenge, when you are given a challenge, and you overcome that challenge, the feedback is something that is very much wired in our DNA, right? As a human being, we need to um, uh, you know, sort of overcome challenges to define us as, as to who we are. If we're not given challenges, then um, you know, life is boring. We get depressed, and it's not something that we're that we're designed for. So, I was uh, being Australian. I was I got into rugby, um, which is a very impact sport. There's lots of uh, <laughs> lots of injuries that can occur and injuries occurred obviously to me being very young and uh, skinny very weak joints I broke quite easily doing mm -hmm. um doing rugby um so both my shoulders I I popped uh which then moved me on to another sport I went to CrossFit and I wanted to compete and be the fittest man in, on earth that is this title that they have it's very attractive if you're a someone in fitness and you want to um you you want to dominate you want to be the best you want this title the fittest on the planet which is something that they've they've taken but um going into crossfit i i had really um a lot of injuries especially on my knees my left knee got very damaged um so i moved away from rugby and i got into come into uh amateur boxing and uh boxing is actually safer than then rugby, a little bit, it's safer as well to, to CrossFit because you're able to control it. If you're good at ring at managing the ring um, in a fight, you're able to actually control the pace and sort of set the terms of engagement or impact on your, um, on your terms. But uh, over lots of hits to the head over years, I found I had a tumor develop in my brain just from micro traumas and um yeah, I had to have it removed. It was about the size of my thumb. But uh, but yeah, going after that, I was told not to do any impact sports. And I got into bodybuilding, which was very fun. I did quite well. I did four four competitions in seven weeks. I, it was very enjoyable. But there's not really a rivalry there, which is kind of key for, for challenges, right? To rise to the challenge. You, it's nice to be against somebody, me versus you. Um but I, I still did quite well and I enjoyed it. But now my big challenge is growing my brand, my red light therapy brand, which is in the re recovery space, encouraging athletes, whether they be pro athletes or, you know, you're a young kid looking to make a college team or even a, 
you know, a, a 70 plus year old uh, retiree, he still wants to hit golf balls. I'm, you know, encouraging them to use um, red light therapy as a means of treatment to manage their pain, to help them recover and get back out there and perform well. Um, so yeah, that's where, that's where my challenge is now. And that's, I guess, that's my, that's my story in a very, very short, short form. But um, yeah, obviously <laughs> we could talk for hours about all the injuries and how, um, how it all started. As your growth between the different sports that you went through, you talked about being skinny and going from rugby to going to CrossFit to boxing. Did you see a growth in your physical fitness throughout the changes of each sport that you went to, especially going into bodybuilding where your growth and just from a presence change, but did you feel the physical changes over time? Yes, absolutely. Of course. I mean, if you're, if you're training your strength, your endurance, you know, your muscular endurance, um, you train your stamina over those years. De definitely. I, I would say across the board, I, I would rate boxing as one of the, the um, most fittest sports that you can do. If you, even if you're v v sort of a, a very a beginner in um, in boxing, you'll find yourself physically and mentally more fit, uh, more able than most other sports that I know. Um, rugby is, um, yeah, rugby is very very fit. Especially if you go if you go competitive, you can you can get a very uh, fit physique that can transfer over to anything else. But still, I would say boxing uh, it was me personally is what I felt when, when I was at my fittest was when I was competing. I was fighting for sure. That was, yeah, yeah. Good, good memories of, of my, um, <laughs> my ring, my ring experience. Did you have any big inspiration motivators in your life growing up? Someone that kind of inspired you to follow your dreams, follow your passions? I was a big, I mean, to this day, I'm, I'm very much a Tyson Fury. I'm a, I'm a Tyson Fury guy. I love that. Um, I love that guy. I love his journey where he beat Vladimir. Those, what, 2000, yeah, when did he beat him? 2015, 16. That was when he, he ended the, the reign of Vladimir Klitschko. Um, for, he was, he was heavyweight champion for about, I think, 11 years. And then he had that slump after he won and um, went into mental depression and then everything. And then he came out and now he's about to fight uh, for the undisputed title in on May 18. That's like in two weeks. But th this story, Tyson Fury, uh, for most of my life, he's been my big, my big hero. I actually got to meet him and not just meet him. But I got to spar with him in the ring, which was a really cool experience. I would say he's my my biggest um, biggest mentor uh, in in everything. He would, if I were to meet somebody again, my favorite person, I would probably still just meet him again. But uh, <laughs> in my younger my younger years, it was um, I was I was not really. He he was someone that I loved and admired because I used to watch the show Star Trek. But I really loved William Shatner. I loved Captain Kirk. And um, I actually got to meet him too. And I got to treat him with uh, with red light therapy. And he had an amazing response to it. But that was my younger childhood was Captain Kirk. And right now, you know, in the last, you know, 10, 15 years, it's been Tyson Fury. Uh, I haven't, I've met them both. So I've, <laughs> I'm one of the, it's, it's very like, when I when I think about it, I'm like, yeah, I've met my two childhood heroes, my my two G's. I've I've already met them. I mean, I don't have anybody else that I I really can say I I've aspired to be or or has motivated me. Just those two, yeah. Pretty. Um, I'm very grateful. The universe has blessed me. I love that you mentioned that, like especially like you watch William Shatner and you found the opportunity that came to cross paths with him and how meeting him and he being involved in what you're doing. It's kind of like when I got to interview some of my people I looked up to watch and I'm like thinking, how in the world did this happen? Like, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to meet them because I watched them on TV for all my life and speaking yeah. to them, it's just amazing feeling because you talked about 
that's a memory that's going to last a long time. And especially the Tyson Fury part, because boxing was such a big part of your life. He plays a big role in the boxing industry and your past cross. And you'll remember that for a lifetime. And those are the moments that mean so much and play such a big impact in people's lives. Yes. Yeah, exactly. When you meet someone that is, it's funny though, because you have an expectation. There's yeah. someone that you really admire. You're like, wow, there's, there's something I resonate with this person, what they're doing, what they're saying, the tone of their voice, how they're kind of um, just how they're packaging information. You, you're uptaking it, you know, in a better way than you would somebody else. But you have an expectation. You think like, oh, when I meet them, are they going to be a dickhead? Are they going to kind of like, you know, you you don't want that, right? Because they're your hero. But with um, but with Tyson Fury, he like far exceeded my expectations. He was so much more cool, awesome, friendly um, than I than than how I imagined he would be. He was just he he's he's he is not just a great boxer, but as a personality outside the ring, he does have a very good impact. If you stand in front of him and he talks to you, he's he's able to excite you, motivate you, um, because he's been through a real rough journey, right, in in his life. And the same with with William Shatner, like meeting him, uh, he he is like what 90, 96. I I I met him like a few weeks before his birthday, and he was extremely old. He's very old, a very and quite broken. He had arthritis on his shoulder and it was creeping down and it, uh, to his bicep. And when you see Captain Kirk, you know, he's, he, Captain Kirk never dies. That's the thing yeah. in Star Trek. He has the away team that always gets shot, but he never dies, right? And I used to dress up as him as a kid uh, for my birthday, for Halloween, you know, for Christmas. I would always dress up as Captain Kirk and I'd go around shooting everybody shooting on my friends and they would try to get me and I'd be like, you can't kill me. Captain Kirk never dies. That was my, <laughs> that was the thing. Um, but then when you see him in real life and his, he's at that age and he's, he's older, he's kind of not as um, agile. He's not that, not Kirk anymore. Right. He's in a, he's, he was in a wheelchair and he, and I, I almost like broke down crying to be, to see him how he was. Um, but his brain is still fully intact. He's still witty. You know, he has that funny Captain Kirk humor. Um, and we would like the conversation he has is are about like AI space reality. Like he's still extremely smart um, and really, really friendly, you know, just, just how you would imagine Kirk to be, you know, when you meet him, he sort of has that, you know, that, uh, that attitude. So that was, again, my expectations were really, um, were, you know, it's far surpassed my expectation. So, yeah, I consider myself extremely lucky. You know, my, I have friends that have, you know, the Dwayne, the Rock Johnson or Taylor Swift, that's their hero. And I'm thinking like, wow, I feel lucky that the people that I've met, not only did I get to meet them, I got to engage with them, you know, very, very, very closely, but they also were very nice to me. Like I, I, I put my investment in the right place. You know, you know what I mean? Like growing up, I had that, I, um, I, I picked the right hero. Whereas someone who's extremely famous, Drake, you know, Jay-Z or, you know, these guys, they, I would imagine meeting them would be very difficult. And maybe also the engagement, you probably, it wouldn't, you know, it, it, it may not be how you would expect, right? They're dealing with a lot of people um so they're not you know they don't really have time to personally connect and with their fans you know and say like yeah you you've invested in the right place i'm a good person you know here's some energy some motivation keep going fulfill your dreams they're not um it, it may not be like that right as a competitive athlete bodybuilding is one of those challenging sports and industries that play a big toll not just physically but mentally and emotionally for you, what was one of the challenging parts with bodybuilding for you personally? Oh, body bodybuilding, like, um, yeah, getting up on stage. Uh, to be honest, like going from bodybuilding, going, doing all the other sports, going into bodybuilding, 
I didn't, I really didn't find it as challenging as, as the other sports. It's just diet. You just have to count your calories. And it's quite monotonous. It's quite boring, but it's also very safe. It's you're not really going to get injured doing bodybuilding. You just, you're dieting. I had a coach. Um, I had a few coaches throughout the whole time that I was competing and, you just follow their protocol. Don't, don't eat this. You know, sure you get hungry, but you deal with it. It's not like, I didn't find it mentally or physically challenging compared to the other sports. I did, I did, I did meet um, like even, but my, but yeah, but also thinking about it when I was going to bodybuild, I was more interested in the experience of challenging myself. When I saw the other competitors, I wasn't thinking like, Oh, I want to beat him, or I, you know, his shoulders are bigger than mine, or he's got better abs. Like I wasn't thinking that. I was more enjoying the experience, and you know, how if I'm gonna do this, how well am I? I'm, I was curious how well I would perform just for myself. But but for but for boxing, I want to go fight. I want to win, and I'm looking at the my competitor, and I'm looking at how I can beat him. Right. I want to I want to win. I want to dominate in that sport with bodybuilding. I wasn't interested in like, you know, oh, I want my pro card or I want to win, um, you know, my the overalls or I wasn't interested. I was just like, I want to get up on stage to see how I do. Who's better? Like the judge is deciding. I don't have to agree with what the judge is saying. So I was I was very much wasn't it emotionally invested in it. But the other bodybuilders i that uh, friends of mine that were all competing it was it was more it was more mentally challenging for them like i they would come in and there would be the the time when everybody's getting that spray tan yeah. <laughs> the spray <laughs> tan. <laughs> and you know i remember one bodybuilder like coming up to me and he was like that guy is he is he bigger than me and i remember looking at him and looking at the guy and i was like you're five times bigger than him like but because they have that, um, what's it called? When you see body dysmorphia, mm -hmm. you know, where the perception of their self is a bit skewed because they're so focused on visuals, like how they look. They're not really, so it, it, it was acro across the board. A lot of them were like that. They weren't really enjoying it. They were, they were very mentally stressed based on the competition. Whereas I didn't really, I wasn't invested in it. If I were, to, if I were to go back and compete again, and there was like something on the line, like, I don't know, I needed to, I needed to win or to get some contract or some sponsorship, which a lot of these guys are doing. Um, then yeah, I would get invested in it. I would be looking at the competition and be like, oof, I need to work on this. I need to work on this. I need to sort of get in front of the guy and the posing. I need to try to hide him. You know, I need to, even to that point. But for me, I was, yeah, I would, I would say boxing is still the best the best rivalry experience you can get <laughs> with boxing, bodybuilding, or any of the sports that you played. Is there a memorable competition stage aspect that was a top one for you? Like it sticks out to what happened, the experience you talked about the experience. So was there one that had a major experience for you? Yeah, there, uh, there was one fight I did where I was late showing up to the fight I somehow ha had it in my head where um, I'll arrive to the as the event is happening. I won't arrive early. I'll arrive just when I need to, and I'll literally go straight into the ring. Like I won't have this time where I'm sitting with all my wraps on, sort of waiting for my time. I will I will try to plan it to where I can just you know go straight to the ring. And I don't know why I had that idea to do that. I think it was it was very foolish. But um, the organizer was calling me um, saying, get here, you're late, because I was the final fight. I was the main event. And um, I was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, I'm coming, I'm coming. And there was traffic. There was traffic. There was like, it was, it was. So during that time, I was sort of putting my wraps on in the car, putting up, putting on my shoes. Um, it the, built the anxiety up very high on the way. And to the point where I was running into the venue, you know, you know, my rap still undone, you know, my, uh, my coach was like holding everything, chasing after me and rushing into the ring, uh, into the backstage area. I had like, 
it was my anxiety was too high. Like I, I was, I was almost like I couldn't breathe because then you're rushing through the crowds. Everyone's like, where are you? Why are you late? Um, I remember being like the door leading out to the auditorium. Like I was banging at the door. Like, I'm, you know, I was, I was just super angry and getting in to the ring. I was so I remember, I think I, I, I <laughs> I think when, you know, when the coaches pull you, to the, the, the the ref, he pull you, pulls you together and says, like, gives you the rules. I remember I, like, shoved the, um, the my opponent, uh, or I tried to headbutt him or something, and she, and the, the ref, she came up to me, and she was like, you know, you need to calm down, stop. <laughs> and I was like, right. <laughs> but it just built up my anxiety to where I gassed out. Like, I had a very good first round um, the, the second round was kind of, I, I still held on, but by the third round I was done. Like I was just my arms, like I couldn't even lift my arm, like up, much less block or, or throw anything. But that really taught me like boxing's not about, it's not a, it's not fighting, it's boxing. And that's a common thing that, you know, coaches will tell you is they'll say, don't, don't fight your opponent. You need to box your opponent. It's a craft. It's an art. It's more about managing yourself, your heart rate, your emotions, right? Your anxiety. And it's about playing a game. It's an, it's like dancing, you know, you're trying to sort of tease him, you know, you're, 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 you're trying to see what you're making him react to you. And then you hit him, right? It's not go, it's not MMA, right? UFC, you'll see ding, ding, you'll see the guy charge. And they, they they get together and they just, uh, they go to the ground. It's all about like, it's that's fighting. But boxing is about like, I'm coming, I'm back. I'm ba you know, it's this game where you, you, you're you teasing with the person. So he's like, what's, what's he, what's he going to do? Is he going to throw? And you're making him mess up. That's the, that's the game. Um, so I learned a lesson, like don't, uh, I lost, obviously lost that fight, but yeah, I learned a lesson that it's, to, to not just to, to be very calm in the entire process, enjoy it and play it, play with, play with your opponent. Don't um, it, it's, a, it's, it's about just as much about having fun as it is about like winning and, you know, competing and everything. Cause the fun part actually is what will get you to that third round or fourth round or fifth round. Like that, that's what will, will get you to the, to the end and get you to win. But yeah, good lessons. As we will talk more about being the CEO of Luma Flex, was that always the goal job? As sometimes we ask, what's that dream job? Was that you always see yourself as a business owner or what was that dream job that you were always wanting? Was it being in CrossFit, boxing, competitive bodybuilder, a different sport, a different career path? Yeah. Wow, that's a meaty question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, I think growing up, I wanted to be an athlete, but then it's if you're an athlete, you you need a really good team to support you, and you need the right sports that can give you the return. Um, so I kind of pivoted to that and got into fitness, and I opened up a lot of gyms. I, I was always a business owner. I don't like to use the word entrepreneur because I think it's kind of like overused. But it's, I always wanted to build a business myself. And rather than work for someone, I just want to do, do it my, my way. Like, I'll just do my own shit. Like, that's whether it's called, okay, I was an entrepreneur. Okay, I was, a, I guess you could say I was an entrepreneur. But um, being a, the, the CEO is basically the one that, in my opinion, is the, it takes all the responsibility. <laughs> you know, like, the buck's, that's buck's, you can't be like, uh, talk to him, you know. <laughs> We're both owners, co-owners. Like that's not you can't do that. You have to take you know all the responsibility. So I think you know just doing doing different business relationships in fitness where you co-owned something or co-founded something. It was always you. I I would say I was building my ex expertise to be able to take on more responsibility. So then you know when the time comes to where you're saying okay I'm you know I think it's time to build this and build it strong. I'll take full responsibility on this. That's, I think, yeah, it's it's just the elevation. Like an athlete, when they're going for competitions, they're going for, like, you do amateur boxing, right? Then you get found by a manager. He then signs you. You do your pro debut. 
right? That pro debut is, is a milestone. And then you start building your pro career. And then you start looking at title fights, right? To be able to access interim, you know, uh, t- title fights where I'm now the next in line. And then your ultimate milestone is when you get a world title, right? I guess with business, it's the same where you you sort of take a, a directorship, you know, you take a foundership, you take a, a partnership, and then eventually you're like, okay, I'm going to now, I'm going to be the last person that you talk to. If, if anything goes wrong, I'll take it. But if anything goes right, I'll take the credit. You take that. That's sort of like a, a milestone you take in business. Um, so I guess I was, I don't know if I was ready for it. I don't know. You sort of learn on the way, but um, I guess I was just, I had the appetite for that challenge. So with, yeah. with Lumaflex, it's a concept that is kind of really getting popular with red light therapy. When did you come up with the concept of the business? And when did you know that this is my path now and I'm ready to take this to the highest level I can? Yeah, the the red light therapy, how I got into it was actually from my wife. So my wife um, introduced it to me through, it was like a, it was a lamp that you would have like on your desk, right? And it was, it was black and had a very large weighted base, but it was a very ugly black looking, you know, something like Batman would use to torture his <laughs> criminals. You know, it was like this, it was this ugly lamp thing but it but it worked it had a very large red bulb and um it, it would get very hot the the bulb would get very extremely hot and i back then i thought the heat was the therapy i thought that was the treatment and that was when i was doing crossfit and it was my knee my knee was getting damaged so i was you know my knee would get damaged because i would do i would do olympic lifts like snatch clean jerk right to where you're 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 sort of slamming on the ground with your you got your Olympic lifting shoes and you're making to be able to get the momentum to be able to lift heavy load. So I would the you know do doing that and kind of getting broken with the knee and it getting worse and worse and worse and then finally not really being able to do much as far as lifting goes, getting all you know depressed and angry. Um, my wife said, "Look, try this. Put it twenty minutes um, every night. Aim it at your knee." And so I would lift my knee up and I'd position it under my knee and I'd play this game where I would put the knee close to the light bulb, but it would get really hot. So I'd be getting the treatment, but then I'd have to move the knee away because it was getting so hot and I'd go back and forth and then 20 minutes were up and I was like, all right, it's done. Um, but it, the pain stopped after about a week and two weeks, I stopped using the the lamp. We gave it to, to her grandfather. Um, but that interested me as to what red light therapy was because it had a really good effect on me and that knee, which was out of all the, the injuries I had, I I felt the knee, the knee one was the one that kind of broke me because not being able to walk, not being able to train. And it being, it, w- it was very debilitating because sitting down like in a chair or in, a, in an Uber or in a plane, I couldn't sit at that, that, that angle. My knee couldn't handle that for more than... 10, 15 minutes, I couldn't, it would just get too, too painful. I'd have to stretch the knee and I would have, um, I'd have this deep heat rub. You can easily buy it like in Walgreens. Like it's like a, a, a cream that you put on and it heats up and creates a lot of um, blood circulation to that area. I would just carry that with me everywhere and I would just rub it. I would temporarily sort of appease the, you know, the pain. Um, but not be, having to do that anymore got me interested and kind of got me down the, the, uh, the rabbit hole of what red light therapy is. And it was shocking because it's, it's something, you know, back then I thought, you know, you're, you're an athlete, you're supposed to have pain. Pain is part of the plan the you know, the package, it's what you take on. It's like your cross to bear, you know, it's uh you know, stay hard, that whole David Goggins sort of mentality. And if you're going to, you know, if you're going to do something to appease the pain, you're looking at surgery, you're looking at to like, some some heavy drugs it, that that's how i thought i didn't think you could use something like light which was natural non-invasive to be able to fix that i it, it was so foreign to me um so getting into light and understanding the power of light and and all the different um outcomes that it can create that got me interested in building a device that would have been suited for me rather than this ugly lamp that i used right so portability was very important 
Um, I, you know, moving around a lot as by nature, I'm, I'm always moving. So I wanted something that was in my bag all the time. Um, so I, I didn't want to have something at home. I have to go to that, you know, pick it up, put it near the, I didn't want, I wanted it to just be wherever I want it. I can have it. Right. It's like, you know, Theragun, these, these massage guns, they mainstreamed yeah. that, uh, massage. That's what I thought. I was like, I want to, I need to be able to mainstream red light therapy anytime, anywhere on the go. Like that was, that was the idea. So creating, creating the, mm -hmm. um, the LumaFlex, I, um, yeah, here we go. This is the bang. There we go. Oh, wow. So that, you know, the panel, this is silicone. So it's, in, it's very, meaning it's very flexible. So it can shape, you know, you can shape it to a muscle or a joint, right? If you're sore elbow, sore shoulder, sore knee, you can shape the silicone panel to that area, right? And you're maximizing the treatment, right? So that you're not letting the light escape with a panel that's like with, with a fixed shape. Um, so you, then that's the idea. You aim it at the pain, you know, wherever you're feeling that, that, that soreness, that discomfort, especially on the lower back has a large enough surface area to where you, you know, you can put it on your back. Um, but that's kind of where I, 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 there's a lot of applications out there, lots of, you know, panels, beds, and they all have their use cases just for me, you know, communicating to athletes at least, or aspiring athletes, I I thought, look, you need a portable device. Um, you need a device that is very durable for an athlete. It needs to be in the gym bag, you know, along with your pre-workouts and wrist wraps and everything, right? Um, so that's kind of where it came. Where it's more, you know, I'm communicating to the active audience and encouraging this to be used as a pain management solution. You've done training, you're sore, this is where you can use it. You're recovering from an injury, you know, you, you, this is how you can use it, right? That's kind of, that's that's my focus, is that audience and that uh, that niche. But yeah, pretty cool, huh? That is pretty cool. Yeah. I like the the design of like the, the light kind of weaves, sort of like very Iron Man. I was about to say, Iron someone's going to buy one and they're just going to make their own Iron Man costume. Because that's like <laughs> when you first brought it up. I was like, oh, he's going to go for that Iron Man costume right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just You're just going to be like healing yourself at the same time for three hours as a kid, just walking around wearing that costume or wearing their costume with that on there. But maybe they have pain. Yeah. And they're just doing it both ways. Yeah, that's it. And the, on the back of your spine, this is an area I do quite often, especially when, you know, throughout the day when you're you're hunched over on your computer, I tend to get a little bit of neck stress, a little bit of neck pain, kind of then feeds into a headache. But this after 10 minutes, that's the that's like a, a secret spot for me. Really good for your. What is the future with just you personally or LumaFlex? What are your, hopefully your goals in the next few years that you are wanting to accomplish? Or what are some exciting things in your future? I, I would hope that we really, you know, as a team, I've got a great team, very passionate and dedicated to, you know, sharing red light therapy with the world. And the, obviously, the, all of the companies in photobiomodulation that we're all trying to communicate red light therapy out and encourage its use. Um, I would hope that this company can grow into something very large and make a massive impact and be, you know, the, yeah, I mean, to really, if, if we're, we're going to dream, let's dream, right? Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, to, to have sort of be part or at least credited somewhat um, to be in the company that mainstreamed red light therapy, meaning like, we popularized it. We made it a trend. We made it like sexy, cool, fun. Like, oh, you got a, you know, you got red light therapy. You got uh, to be able to be able to create a trend like that. But then also, uh, you know, on the, you know, getting the product out on the distribution side to be able to have it in, you know, the major retail chains to be have a device, a LumaFlex in, um, you know, Best Buy, Target, um, you know, all of the the big gym chains. Um, to where it's so like, oh, you know, it it becomes the normal, right? Because red light therapy, we're sort of 
we're just about to see it take off in my opinion and it's a, in the next 5 years i think that's where we're really going to start to see red light therapy explode and everyone will have you know one two maybe even up to three devices in their home and it won't necessarily be for pain relief it could be for beauty which is you know red light therapy is very big in beauty um but it will uh but that's where i think we're going we're on the on the cusp of something big in the next say three to five years. So that if I, if someone were to say like, you know, what's the stamp that you want to put on the world? Like what's the legacy? Oof, that's a, that's a heavy word, huh? Legacy. Um, I, I would say, yeah, I would like to be part of the discussion that, you know, that's credited to mainstream and red light therapy. That would be, um, that'd be a big one for me. Wow. <laughs> The final question I'll ask you for someone that's listening to this interview based on your journey and experience, what tips or advice would you give them to overcome obstacles, accomplish their goals and rise to the challenge? Yeah, right. Rise to the challenge is the, is the key. You have to accept that challenges are part of life and that the it's like playing a computer game where you're on level one and you fight the monsters and then you go to level two and then monsters are a bit bigger and you fight those and you go, you can't go to the next level unless you, you know, overcome those challenges. So like growing up, I, I had like a system that I would kind of re keep rethinking myself and reminding myself, like when you're in tough times, I always tell them, you know, this is how it is. It's like level one is where you, where you accept challenges, you know, you, ex you it, acceptance is level one. That's like, you know, oh, I accept that this is hard. I accept that this didn't go the way I planned. I accept I got this injury. You accept it, right? Challenges, I accept this challenge, right? It's part of life. It's the human experience. Let's go. And then level two is where you appreciate the challenge. You rewire your brain to where, you know, as the challenge is, is coming in, as you're getting faced with it, you would start to appreciate it. You're like, thank you. Thank the universe. You thank God. You thank you know, whichever you just put yourself into an appreciation mindset, because you know, once you overcome this, you go on to the next level, right? You, you, you hit the milestone and you, you're progressing, you're going up, right? Not down. But the, the actual final level, the God mode is where you've trained your brain so much to appreciate challenges that actually, you know, the benefit of overcoming challenges so you look for challenges. That's level, that's God mode. That's like all the high performers in the world, whether they be in sport or business or, or, or whichever, whichever career, they've trained themselves to always be looking for challenges. They always look for the hard stuff. They look for the grind because they know that's, that, that's fast tracking them to overcoming and then exceeding and going to another, another level. So level one, accept level two, appreciate level three is look for. So I, I kind of try to, you know, wake up every day and then be like, okay, I'm I need to look for a challenge as much as it sucks. <laughs> you, you're like, oh no, I want to, I just want an easy day, right? I want to sip my coffee, you know, answer some emails, yeah. sign some documents and then go back to bed. It's like, no, we need to look for challenges. You know, where's the hard stuff? Let's go. That's yeah. If that's helpful. <laughs> John, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about your rise to the challenge. You're inspiring so many people and we are excited to see what the future looks like for you. Thank you. Yeah, much appreciated. Tune in next time to hear my next guest talk about their rise to the challenge. Remember to follow, subscribe on all major audio platforms. And make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to the link episode and video format. What path do you take to accomplish your goals? You decide.